Good afternoon, and welcome to The Appeal Live, a co-production of Now This and The Appeal. I'm Alana Sivan, and today we're going to talk about why Houston's jails are so crowded and what can be done to fix that. So right now there are over 8,500 people who are locked up at the Harris County Jail. They're packed into unsafe and unsanitary conditions in the middle of a still raging pandemic. Nearly 88% of the people who are sitting in jail cells have not even been convicted of a crime. They are sitting there pre-trial and around half of them are locked up on nonviolent charges with hundreds facing only misdemeanors. Now, the large number of people being incarcerated pre-trial in Harris County has been a longstanding issue. In fact, a few years back, a federal court ruled that there were too many people who were being held pre-trial behind bars simply because they couldn't afford to pay their way out. They couldn't afford the bail that was set on their cases. And so as a result, many people who were charged with nonviolent misdemeanors were released without having to pay bail. They simply had to pledge to show up for their court date. And while this was a huge step in moving forward on pretrial justice in Houston, it only applied to a small subset of people. Today, there are still hundreds, if not thousands of people in the Harris County Jail who are only behind bars because they don't have enough money to pay their way out. And while officials have identified a large number of people who could be safely released, there has been serious resistance from key county officials to do that. Harris County DA Kim Ogg has been steadfast in denying requests to reduce bail so that people could return to their lives while they're waiting for their trials. And now outgoing Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo has continued the practice of arresting and jailing people on low level offenses. And none of this comes as a surprise to justice reform advocates. It's exactly what they've come to expect from Og and Acevedo in recent years. They both claim to be progressive in the past, but they have actually emerged as reliable opponents to any move away from cash bail. And they both claimed without evidence and indeed against much of the evidence that doing so would endanger public safety. And so to talk more about bail reform in Houston and what it would actually do and the role that this stalled effort is playing in Harris County's overcrowded jails. I'm so pleased today to be joined by Houston City Council member Letitia Plummer, Harris County Commissioner Rodney Ellis, and Megan Stevenson of the University of Virginia. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to start out with Council Member Plummer and Commissioner Ellis. Can you describe what the situation is currently like in Houston with jail overcrowding and these massive pileups in the court system more generally. So Council Member Plumber, I'll, Plumber, I'll start with you on this one. Okay, I'm actually gonna defer to my to, my, to Commissioner Ellis. I think that he could lead that conversation. Um, I'm on the local more municipal level and um, I would love to, to allow him to answer that one first and I can jump in. We've had a confluence of factors that add to it. Obviously, everybody says they're for reform. Usually that's the case before they are against it. Uh, so here we are in the home of George Floyd, and the tragedy is that uh, we still have more folks going into that jail and more people sitting there uh, than we have had in a, in a very long time. Obviously, in the middle of a pandemic, that adds to it as well. A uh, historically weak indigent defense system is a part of it. Uh, the lack of moving forward on felony bail reform. You know, we did make tremendous progress on misdemeanor bail reform. And a lot of people who are critical of what's going on are conflating misdemeanor and felony bail and people who pay to get out on bail. Uh, but we're stymied there. Uh, and, you know, obviously, regardless of what may happen, in the federal district court, Judge Lee Rosenthal, at some point uh, in Texas and in Louisiana, you go to what has historically been the dreaded Fifth Circuit, anti-civil rights circuit, even on a misdemeanor case, at some point, if the judges, the Democratic judges had not won and settled that lawsuit, it would have been very difficult for us to make a progress on misdemeanor bail. But hey, here's a shot of it. No progress has been made on felony bail. It's still in court. In the discovery phase, 
Alec Karakatsanis and a great group of lawyers who are suing us, suing County, uh, are there. Uh, obviously, it didn't help much when we had key actors in the system who were critical of the minor progress that we made with misdemeanor bail. You know, it was a big deal, but it only applied to a small fraction of the cases. And we had works here. Harris County uh, handles a widow host. Most people who end up being arrested come from the city of Houston. That's our county seat. There are other cities here as well. The sheriff's department can pick up people as well. Our sheriff has been a big reformer uh, in this space. It certainly didn't help uh, when we were getting so many uh, criticisms of the judges on the individual cases coming from uh, the Houston Police Department. That was a big problem. But we kind of stuck. And in a lot of ways, it's sort of unfortunate when you think that we jumped out of the box on misdemeanor bail. Many people reform that felony system, bail system in general, because of that very thoughtful ruling that came from Judge Lee Rosenthal on Houston misdemeanor bail. But we are stuck. It's diamond. And around the edges, I was on a call earlier today. We're trying to push to do as much as we can uh, on the indigent defense side. There are bills that are moving through the legislature. If they pass, may even create problems and put us back in court on what we did on misdemeanor bail. Uh, but you are in a, a deep red, far right state. And my suspicion is anything that passes at my old chamber, place where I used to work, the Texas legislature, won't be a good thing on the bail front. Bail is a big part of it. In short, it's a big problem. You know, so I'll, I could definitely jump in now. And because I think that he clarified a lot was happening on the on the county level from a, from a municipal perspective. Um, it's, it's obviously an issue. There was one um, piece of ordinance that was being passed uh, for failure to appear. And one thing that I, I love about our commissioner's court um, allowed us to uh, to bring forward was um, people that did not uh, show up to court for multiple reasons in the middle of COVID, most of them being financial. Um, we were not able to, we, we continued to find them and, and hold them in contempt. And those are the smaller issues that are, are very large from our local level politics. And so what we were able to push forward with was um, safe harbor courts, which are bringing into communities uh, to allow people to feel safe and to go um, to uh, local areas within their community. They're not going to a specific court system because what we're finding is that these, like like uh, Commissioner said, what these misdemeanor acts are, most of the time, they just can't pay the fine because they're either unemployed or they're just in an area of poverty to where they're, they're unable to um, to, to, to make those fines, um, to make th those fines um, paid. In addition to that, what we find on a local level is, is the police force. And so, we're, you know, what's very, very apparent um, in many ways is that we are stopping um, black and brown people in lower income communities. And once you know, once a police stop happens, um, the percentage of them being, uh, the car being searched is incredibly high. But even more than that, a lot of those percentages increase and it goes toward arrests. So those are issues from a local level that we're finding and that that I personally am, am really fighting for. And it's really nice to have a partner on the on the on the county side uh, to assist with making this happen. Because you have Megan here, I should mention pretrial supervision is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the person we had in previously uh, from the old regime that ran the county, I don't think was doing a very good job. We created a justice administration department. We have a series of dashboards that are coming out of it. A guy who used to run the State Indigent Defense uh, Commission and did a public defender's office up in, in West Texas. Very thoughtful guy, Jim Bethke. Very interesting person to have on at some point. But he's very data-driven. We put together a strong staff uh, over there. He is on an interim basis running pretrial. But, you know, a lot of things. These people standing up outside a building, even when it's freezing, you know, with their family members so they can go in and be tested. Uh, and the last factor I'd throw in would be, look, Crime has increased in some categories, most places in the country, because we're in a pandemic, you know, and in addition to being in a pandemic, people have been locked up for a year. So you have far more mental health issues and a host of issues that are coming out. But our numbers are no, not nearly as high in terms of the uptick as they are in other parts of the country. But it's so easy to show, we call it, Willie Hartnize in the individual case, you know, our friends over at Crime Stoppers will go out and take the most sensational cases and blow them up. And then the media 
feeds on that because it's a normal story. That's how we got to where we are out of Massachusetts in the middle of a campaign with the Willie Horton case. And some of it is that pushback that people are having to the outpouring of emotion, the serious conversations going on around this country and even in this city of Houston and in this county of Harris about responsible criminal justice reforms. But at the end of the day, here's the, here's the, the hard part. To most people, reform is just a six-letter word. You know, and it sounds like part of the problems you're talking about is you have sort of this incorrect framing of criminal justice reform from crime stoppers and things like that. Um, you have the police department who is not using their power to decline arrest. But then you also have, as a huge part of the problem, is the DA's refusal to cooperate on efforts to bail people out of jail. Um, so I was hoping the two of you, and after I ask, and after I ask these two that question, Megan, I promise I'm going to come to you. Um, I, can you tell us more about why the DA has stood in the way of these recent moves to release more than a thousand people who were determined not to be a safety risk? I think it's going into that normal mantra that you've seen historically around the country. It is a fear that just one person may be released and be charged with a crime. And that's, as I said earlier, how we got to where we are. I think it was an overreaction. And for so long in this country, people have just gotten away with it. You know, uh, you know, the easy thing to do is just go run on law and order. And at the end of the day, historically, uh, that is how somebody won. Now, there have been changes. You've had some very progressive DAs uh, around the country. Look, I also want to say, even with... Uh, some of our, our judges, when we need someone to speak up, look, some pushback, you can't talk about a specific case, but I'm telling them, my, my friends on, on the bench, you know, you got to speak out. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a criminal lawyer. But, you know, past, you, if you know my record, I passed a lot of criminal justice reforms over the years. Uh, but in terms of the intricate details of the system that the professor lives with every day, you know, I'm a policymaker. I'm a highly skilled journalist. And look, I, I make this comment a number of times. Any prosecutor in the country, by the way, any one of them can do more in one week in terms of criminal justice reform than I could do during my 26 years in the Texas Senate, having to walk through that process. We give tremendous discretion uh, to prosecutors uh, in this country. So it's kind of changing that mindset is a difficult thing. So, Professor Stevenson, I want to hear from you um, what your response is to the people who are saying what the commissioner talked about, who claim that people can't be released because it's a threat to public safety and would increase violence and murders. Have you seen any data anywhere that backs up that claim? Uh, I have not seen that data. It's, it's hard to predict who's going to commit crime. Um, but what I what I hear when I hear people talking like this is I hear a presumption of detention. I hear this idea that once you've arrested somebody, they've got some allegations against them, maybe a probable cause has been met. Like the prosecutor and the sheriff can just own that person. They can just take that person and do with when, them what they will. There's a presumption in the back of people's minds, because this is how it's been in our criminal justice system for a while, that if somebody has been arrested, you can just put them in jail and keep them there until either they've proven that they're low enough risk that they can be released or, you know, the case is disposed of. Now, that goes against the premise of our criminal justice system. You're, you're presumed innocent in this country, at least theoretically. That's the idea, right? Uh, probable cause is not enough to say that we don't care about your well-being, that we'll put you in this concrete cage, oftentimes with temperatures soaring well above 100 degrees, facilities in Texas with no air conditioning, humidity, disease, COVID, people dying, assault, being separated from your family, being separated from your job, probably losing your job, maybe losing your employment. Now, this is a serious harm that the state commits against a person who is presumed innocent. The way it should be is there should be a presumption that they should go home. 
And the burden is on the state to prove that they're so dangerous that the state can do that to a human being. Jail is no joke. Jail is serious. Jail is really serious and should be taken that way and hasn't been. It hasn't been for a long time. And we've gotten used to it. You know, just like you throw the pot and, you know, the, the frog in the water and you turn the, the stove on and all of a sudden we're in this situation where like, this is considered normal. That after arrest, you know, mere allegations have been made at this point. Nothing has been proven. There has been, you know, really no detailed look at the case. Prosecutors often don't even really take a look at this case until weeks, sometimes even months after the point of arrest. There is usually just a police report, a few allegations. And, you know, in our current system, if you can't make that money bail, the money bail that's set after 30 seconds, a minute, maybe two minutes at the most in the hearing, a two minute maximum hearing, you bail set, you can't make that money bail, you are thrown in the concrete cage for a long time. Now that this is <laughs> this is the system that people are defending on the basis of the idea that maybe some of them in the future might commit crime. And that's true. But putting somebody in jail, <laughs> that's a serious harm that needs to be balanced against the possibility that somebody might do something in the future. Many of these people, most of them have some mental health issue. Uh, and the amount of bail for many of them is not tied. Here's an interesting fact to it. More than 87% of the individuals in the Harris County Jail, this is last month, were awaiting trial or other resolution of the cases. 19% uh, percent have a bond set at under $10,000. That means they, they don't have $1,000. About one-fifth are detained for drugs, one-tenth for property charges, and uh, about uh, half are detained uh, for a violent felony offense. All innocent until proven guilty. But my point is, that's only about half uh, of those would be detained for uh, an alleged violent felony offense. And I, I, do, I can't stress enough how important the lack of a credible indigent defense system is. The way we do it in Texas, 254 counties, uh, we don't have a strong history of public defender offices. Harris County didn't create one until about a, a decade ago, up until two years ago, was handling maybe 15, 16% of the cases. We made a commitment after George Floyd's funeral to put the funding up to be able to handle 50% of those cases within two years. Because when you come in contact with the system, it's you and your lawyer. And you have judges who are picking lawyers because it is the judge's decision as to whether or not they use the public defender. If they don't pick the public defender, they pick the lawyer. Uh, so that's a big challenge. So I just want to stress, in addition to bail felony bail reform, that's a big problem. I don't think we get there in Texas, by the way, unless the court mandates it or the politics of the legislature changes and we can pass a responsible bail reform bill. And New York did it. You know, they did it in Cook County, by the way. Illinois has done it now through the legislature. Uh, California's made progress. You know, we're 5 million people in Harris County. LA uh, County is 10 million people. We're the second largest jail in the country. Only, only county jail with more people than we have would be LA County. And I think with the resources they're gonna put into mental health issues and reimagining their system in part because the voters agreed to put the funding up to do it. When I talk to LA supervisor friends of mine, uh, I think they're gonna put us to shame. So we got a long way to go, a lot to do to educate people here, to get them interested. You know, I don't spend a lot of time focusing on any one individual who's in, in office. The whole system uh, is a mess. And obviously there are consequences to the elections, to elections. That's why a separate issue you got, I hope that federal John Lewis Voting Rights Act passes because in Texas, they're going to try to pass all kind of draconian stuff so they can put even people farther to the right end. And then my two allies who helped bring about misdemeanor bail here, uh, the new county judge, Lena Hidalgo, Commissioner Adrian Garcia, I'm sure there will be people trying to get them out of office. Uh, they're up this next go around. And if I could, if I could jump in too as well, just to add an, an extra element that we need to focus on is, you know, so two things have happened in Houston. We have a new chief, um, which I think is going to be uh, 
incredibly beneficial to the city. And we have laid out um, over 100 pages. Our task force has laid out a, over 100 pages of, of true police reform, what that looks like. I mean, the systemic issue is there, and it happens on a local level. What I, what I believe that our, our responsibility is as city council members or at that local level is figuring out ways um, to not allow our criminal justice system to be a catch-all for the lack of social services. And so how do we make sure we, in, we you know, inject capital into lower income communities to where they actually have opportunities, to where theft and small misdemeanor crimes are not something that they feel, people, that they, feel they have to do um, in terms of survival. And so um, that is one um, very large, um, the large piece. And so the reform part is is critical, and that's something that I really want to focus on in terms of what reform actually looks like uh, to give folks an opportunity. And then once again, you know, creating some economic opportunity for people in lower income communities, so that they don't feel like crime is something that they have to deal with or or or, um, or, or fall into. And I think if we can keep people out of jail, then the the consistent conversation about bill reform is something that maybe we, you know obviously will always remain important but maybe if we can keep them out of jail then um, we don't have to continue to have them um you know reoffend in, in in many areas I see some light hopefully at the end of the tunnel because of the uh, biden harris uh, stimulus package that passed if we have enough latitude that may be funding uh, that we can put into trying to do alternative responder uh, programs, improving the indigent defense system, mm -hmm. uh, something to go in and work through the backlogs uh, that we have, not just a matter of creating more courts so more people can fall into the normal lock them up, throw away the key mentality. Uh, here's a little interesting factoid sometimes we, that people gloss over on George Floyd. Before he was killed in Minneapolis, he was sentenced to jail terms eight times uh, in, in Harris County taking up almost a decade of his life. One of those arrests was for a $10 drug deal in 2004 that led to him spending 10 months in state jail. And that's one way he may well get a posthumous exoneration because the officer uh, who arrested him is part of a scandal involving a uh, uh, the the, uh, the raid over on going on on a street in in Houston, uh, Officer Going. So that one may uh, have been one of the turning points in his life. I'm not saying that was the first time, but I think that was the first major time for him to go and spend ten months uh, in jail. But but look, I mean, it's a uh, it's a big challenge. I think that that stimulus package uh, is going to do more to try to release some generational poverty that we haven't focused on in a long time. If we focus on some equity standards on how we spend that money, there will be a tendency many places in the country to just go spend it on the normal stuff that you do. Just go put more of it in law enforcement if they can get away with it. So I hope Gene Sperling, I think, will have that role that Vice President Biden had when he's vice president to make sure folks don't just go spend that money wherever they want to spend it, but really to improve people's lives. I wanted to bring up one other <laughs> kind of light at the end of the tunnel, like you're talking about, which is that I think the legal landscape regarding bail and pre-child detention is changing and it's changing rapidly. Just this morning, the California Supreme Court put out their opinion on a case that's been winding its way through the appeals courts for a while, the Humphreys case. And what they said is that it is a violation of the California constitution to hold somebody solely for inability to pay their bill. Now, Commissioner Ellis was just talking about the, the number of people in Harris County jails that are held on $10,000. Now, if a judge sets $10,000, what they're saying is, if you can pay for it, you know, go home. Be, you know, lots of people can meet 10,000, but lots of people can't. Lots of people can't. And those that had $10,000 bail and are sitting in jail are sitting in their solely due to inability to pay. And those people should go home. And lots of other people should go home because they're presumed innocent. They're presumed innocent. And without the due process requirements, a careful examination of the evidence that demonstrates that they pose a serious risk to public safety, a serious risk of harm to another human being, there is no justification to take away their freedom in that way.
So see if he's not throw another one on you. Yeah. <laughs> if you got pretrial detention issues, like you, you or the judge says, wear a leg monitor. What well, if you can't pay for it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that that's the same. You get back to the wealth base mm-hmm. detention uh, issue on that side as well. So it is a it's a mess, and it ought to be changed. And and one other piece to add on is if you are in jail and you, and most of these most of these people are essential workers, right? So they're daily hourly workers. You miss one day of of work or two days of work, you don't even have a job to go back to when you get out. And so it just ends up being the, the cyclic effect of, of never being able to get on top of it. So this is something that you've talked a lot about in your, in your paper that you co-authored recently. Um, and where you talked about how the cost of incarceration, including losing your job, all the trauma that's faced from incarceration, the impact it'll have on future cases in the future is almost never worth holding someone in pretrial. Um, and so I'm curious, and, and Commissioner, you mentioned something earlier as well about the necessity of educating the public on the need to reduce pretrial detention. So I want to hear from you, Professor, um, what do you think are the most effective ways to accomplish that education, to get through to people on this issue? What should um, people be telling their constituents or other elected officials who may be bought into this sort of law and order narrative that we're seeing in Houston? Well, I think um, I think it depends on your audience. You're, you're talking to me. I'm an economist. I love data. I love the facts. I'm also a law professor, so I love the law. Let's talk about the legal rationales. But if we're talking about getting through to people, to people's constituents, I think what works is telling stories that capture their hearts. And I think that's what has been so effective this summer about the Black Lives Matter movement that that organizers have been so effective in in, um, conveying a narrative of how deep the suffering is, how deep the the pain is uh, of various criminal justice inequities, um, particularly borne heavily by on the shoulders of black and and brown people. Um, And so, you know, stories that, that make people understand what it's like to be placed in jail on, on the basis of, of a mere allegation, you know, when you're innocent or when the crime you've been accused of is just not that serious, to have your freedom ripped away from you like that. Th- those, are, <laughs> those are the types of stories that I think are really effective in terms of advocacy. Professor Stevenson, I think it is storytelling and I think trusted messengers uh, help you have to say it over uh, and over again. When uh, progressive prosecutors speak out, you know, Philadelphia, San Francisco, uh, Bear County, it helps a lot. When judges will speak out, uh, it helps. Uh, I think other celebrities, when they do it, you know, we're putting together these ba- these dashboards that tell a story, particularly with millennials, you know, kind of demystify uh, how it works. Most people wouldn't realize until you bring it up, the inherent conflict of interest, as an example, of having a judge here in the case pick the lawyer to come before them to represent someone accused of a crime. And when you just look at what we've done in this country, we have some of the highest incarceration rates on the planet nationally. But our crime statistics don't show some correlation between locking all of these people up and reducing crime. And I want to stress on the federal level, they don't have money bail. But in some ways, they have gone, uh, they've done the wrong thing the reverse way. They just go keep uh, everybody, you got me? Instead of figuring out uh, some system, if it's, if someone's not charged with a violent issue, not keeping them in, we don't want to go to the other side and just decide, you got the equal protection argument. Why is it Rodney today could afford to post bail, but Rodney of 40 years ago uh, could not? Uh, you want to make so important. This not work. Awesome. Well, th- that's why the details are so important. You can say that you want to eliminate cash bail, but it ends up detaining everybody. Um, but ultimately, it's about reducing pretrial detention and depopulating jails, especially during a deadly pandemic. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. This conversation has been so informative, um, and keep keep fighting the good fight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So with the pandemic, 
still raging and the jail getting more crowded, a crisis scenario is now unfolding behind bars in Harris County. And this crisis could be averted if law enforcement officials wanted to avert it. The DA could release people. The police chief could stop arresting people needlessly for crimes that have no impact on public safety. And as we've heard from Professor Stevenson, jail is no joke. Holding, the cost of holding people in jail cells pre-trial is devastating under any circumstances. And especially during a pandemic, we have seen people across the country die because they were held behind bars in cages during a pandemic. But pre-trial detention, despite its high costs, is the default, not the exception. It has been treated as the default in a country where there is supposed to be a presumption of innocence against pre-trial punishment. And this is all because officials cling to this belief that it might keep people safe. Officials like DA Kim Og, who seem insistent on leaving people in jail cells even when they haven't been convicted of crimes. They are playing with people's lives, and if they don't take action soon, it seems inevitable that more lives will be lost needlessly because of it. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us on The Appeal Live. You can continue to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next time.